names and presidents have paid her homage. Mark Twain called her the most marvelous woman since Joan of Arc. And millions find in her life a source of inspiration. Yet she herself has said, I sometimes feel like a shadow walking in a shadowy world. Her name is Helen Keller, and this is her biography. Mike Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Helen Keller. Throughout her lifetime, she was tragically isolated. She was locked in an unimaginably dark and silent world. But through relentless effort and almost superhuman courage, Helen Keller achieved a rare and inspiring kind of freedom. I am blind, she said, yet I can see. I am deaf, yet I hear. Author, lecturer, and humanitarian, Helen Keller made a place for herself. Her triumph was often called a miracle. Yet her life was a constant and sometimes tragic struggle to free herself from what she once called a never-ending nightmare. house near Tuscumbia, Alabama, Helen Keller is born. Her mother, Kate Keller, learns that her two-year-old daughter, stricken by a high fever, will be left totally blind, totally deaf. A film recreates Helen Keller's early years, the time when she gropes about in what she will call a phantom world. Her only contact with reality is by smell, taste, or touch. unfamiliar being. She is asked to do the best she can with Helen. Says Anne, I shall try to win her love. Although she soon succeeds in controlling Helen's temper, Anne cannot find the key to her closed mind. Helen has remarkable powers, she writes, and I believe that somehow I shall be able to develop and mold them. Using the finger alphabet, she now forms letters in Helen's hands. One by one, they make words. Anne Sullivan spells them over and over. But young Helen cannot understand. She thinks it is only a game. continues shaping words into Helen's small hand. Then, in the cold flow of water from a well, the mystery of language is at last revealed to Helen. For the first time, she knows that Anne's fingers are saying a word, water. Now, Helen wants to learn about all kinds of things, about things that can hum or buzz or sing.
Helen, suddenly, miraculously, everything and everybody has a name. Ann Sullivan's name is Teacher. Eager to know all she can, imbued with new confidence, young Helen is soon reading books printed in Braille. Then, with ruler and pencil, Ann teaches her to write. Fascinated by her exciting new world, Helen wants to do everything, be everywhere. In a letter to the Perkins Institution in Boston, Helen writes, I will come to see little blind girls. At the school, Helen enrolls in special training classes. Helen's life has become a kind of public property. Tales of her amazing education, her remarkable understanding, are told all over the world. The youngster is admired by scientists, poets, authors. Mark Twain is devoted to her. He makes me feel happy and important, she says. He weaves about my dark walls romance and adventure. Sullivan remains Helen's loving, inseparable companion. All the best of me belongs to teacher, Helen writes. There is not a talent, aspiration, or joy in me that has not been awakened by her loving touch. Still in her early teens, Helen sets her heart on going to college. At Radcliffe College, with Anne's help, Helen excels as a student. She learns half a dozen languages, is elected vice president of her class. She even writes a best-selling autobiography. She crowns her achievements in 1904 when she graduates cum laude from Radcliffe. In their effort to avoid a curious public, Helen and Anne, with her husband John Mason, retreat to the quiet of the New England countryside. They want none of the many promises of fame and fortune that book publishers have offered Helen. I have, she says, no great adventures to record, no extraordinary success, no thrilling romances. Romance, however, soon finds a place in Helen's life. In 1916, she falls in love with a young man hired to help her and Anne. Helen says she is enchanted by the sweetness of being loved, and she secretly makes plans to marry. But when Mrs. Keller learns of the romance, she demands that the young man be sent away. She is afraid that Helen's marriage will turn into a mockery. For Helen, the glowing hope of being part of a man's life ends abruptly, unhappily. But she writes... My brief love will remain in my life an island of joy surrounded by dark waters. Love is like a beautiful flower which I may not touch. Still in her twenties, she becomes a leading figure in the crusade for the blind. She is also known as a prominent member of the suffragette movement. Says Helen, I am paying my own expenses through the world, and I am proud of it. An enchanted public wants to believe all kinds of myths about her. It is said that Helen can sculpt, paint, play the piano. That she can do anything that anybody with all his faculties can do. I am trying with all my might to be like everybody else, she says. I want to forget my limitations. producers are clamoring for a chance to tell the story of Helen's life on the silent screen. She's finally persuaded to star in a movie called Deliverance. Says a naive Helen, we set out to make a simple picture. To her dismay, however, the film is far from simple. 
Billed as the eighth wonder of the world, Helen plays a kind of 20th century Joan of Arc. Her only comment is, I was glad when it was all over. The filming of one sequence, however, in which Helen takes a plane ride will remain one of the greatest thrills in her life. I completely forgot my picture self, she writes. During my ride in the open plain, I seem to sense the dance of the gods. I have never, she says, had such a satisfying feeling of physical liberty. Discouraged by the box office failure of deliverance, Helen and Anne make a decision that shocks the public. They will turn to vaudeville as a means of raising money for the blind. Says Helen, I find this world more amusing than the world I have always lived in, and I like it. We're on the same bill with acrobats and monkeys, but our little act is dignified, and people seem to like it. On the vaudeville stage, Anne demonstrates to audiences how Helen was taught to speak. She felt the vibration of the spoken word. Instantly, she spelled, I want to talk with my mouth. That seemed impossible. But after experimenting for a time, we found that placing her hand in this position, the thumb resting on the throat, right at the larynx, the first finger on the lips, the second on the nose, we found that she could feel the vibration of spoken words. The first word she learned to articulate was the little word, it. With the hand in this position, I made the vowel, I. She felt it, I. Then I made the T. She feels it with the finger on her lips, on my lips. Then I put the two letters together to form the word. It, and the first word was learned. After her seventh lesson, she was able to speak the sentence word by word. I am not dumb now. In the 1930s, Helen Keller works with federal officials like Harry Hopkins to create new opportunities for the blind. The Works Progress Administration has established a project for making talking book machines for the blind. 5,000 of these talking book machines have been made, and they will be distributed into the homes of the blind of America by the libraries of America in the same way that you receive your books in the home. This is one of the most comfortable ways of reading that I know of, and may be envied by those who have their own sight. The person who suggested this project and is responsible for it is Miss Helen Keller, not only the most outstanding sightless person in America, but one of the Republic's foremost citizens. A mounting fear, however, has begun to cast a shadow on her life. Anne Sullivan Macy, her beloved teacher, is exhausted. And tragically, she is becoming totally blind. Helen sadly writes, if teacher were gone away, I should in truth be blind and deaf. In 1936, after years of lingering illness, Anne Sullivan Macy dies. I feel powerless, writes Helen. The fire of teacher's mind, through which I have experienced the light, the music, the glory of life has been withdrawn. Months will pass before Helen recovers from the shock of teacher's death. Now, Polly Thompson, long in the background as secretary and friend, 
becomes Helen's interpreter and companion, filling in many ways the role Anne Macy once played. With Polly as her guide, Helen will continue to push back the boundaries of her confining world. Helen Keller looks forward to exciting new experiences. She hopes to extend her work on behalf of the American Foundation for the Blind to millions of people throughout the world. Keller makes extensive tours of military installations where she will visit the wounded and the disabled. No one knows, she says, the bitterness of limitations better than I do. But to these men, Helen's selfless enthusiasm makes her a living symbol of courage and hope. Now, Helen heads a fundraising drive for the American Foundation for Overseas Blind. Helen and Polly are greeted by enthusiastic crowds on tours that take them all over the world. There is something about Helen that attracts people, Anne Macy has written. It must be her joyous interest in everything and everybody. Says Helen, life is an exciting business, and most exciting when lived for others. her tour, throngs gather to see Helen and to hear her speak. She and Polly make as many as seven appearances a day. Helen's achievement, her worldwide fame, brings showers of praise. She's often called a goddess and a saint. At times, however, Helen has a feeling which she describes as a kind of remoteness one senses out at sea, far from all signs of land. Helen herself admits that her inspiring work is not easy. I'm growing too old for that, she says. Helen, however, will not withdraw from the public eye. Life is either a daring adventure, she insists, or it is nothing. admirers, especially the children, Helen Keller is ageless. I find even the smallest child excellent company, she writes. And I am glad to say children usually like me. Although Helen has mastered a rudimentary form of speech, she regrets that even now she is still unable to express herself clearly before the public. She must rely on Polly to repeat everything she says. I am happy to be back in London. I'm happy to be back in London. I've put, I have so many endearing memories. Of which I have so many endearing memories. And we've put, I am affectionately associated. And with which I am affectionately associated. Visiting a school for deaf children, Helen tells these youngsters, even when speech is not beautiful, there is a fountain of joy in uttering words. Oh, cheer. And it can turn in And I rejoice at your cheer and determination. The obstacles you meet are many. Because the obstacles you meet are many. Oh, every step and road you are traveling. I know every step. Achievements. For Helen 
it is a joy to be surrounded once again by familiar things. To read over and over her favorite books. When I hold a book in my hand, she writes, my limitations fall from me. My spirit is free. Helen is often asked to describe how she feels about various colors, which of course she cannot see. Pink, she writes, is like a baby's cheek or a soft southern breeze. Gray is a soft shawl around the shoulder. Yellow, she says, is like the sun. It means light and is rich in promise. Occasionally, Helen asks Polly to take her to New York City. Fifth Avenue, says Helen, is a very odorous street. I smell delicate food, silken draperies, rich tapestries. I recognize expensive perfumes, powders, creams, choice flowers, and pleasant exhalation from the houses and shops. Here, Helen adds, I gain the comforting certainty that mankind is real flesh, and I myself am not a dream. Suddenly, in December 1959, Polly Thompson falls ill. Helen realizes that for a second time, she will lose the most important person in her life. In the spring of 1960, Polly Thompson is dead. At the age of 80, Helen Keller once again faces a dark and silent world. She will never entirely recover from this great and tragic loss. At home in Westport, at the house she calls Arcan Ridge, Helen is alone. Observers pity me, she writes. But it is because they do not see the golden chamber in my life where I dwell delighted. But dark as my path may seem to them, she says, I carry a magic light in my heart. Almost from the beginning of her strange odyssey, Helen Keller was embarrassed by the high-flown praise showered upon her. She realized the height of her achievement but she declined to pass judgment on its ultimate meaning. God, she said, has been using my life for a purpose I do not know. But one day I shall understand, and then I shall be satisfied. Mike Wallace for Biography.